I have a preacher friend who, uh, when there are technology issues, it just absolutely drives him batty. And uh, almost to the point to where he can't preach when there's something going on with the microphones or the, or the presentation software or something along those lines. And uh, it's, a, it's a rough world for someone like that. Thankfully, I'm not like that. I, uh, I started running back, in fact, right after the song to get the iPad that I usually use to change slides and then thought, oh, yeah. And, uh, and came on up. So we'll, uh, we'll do without the slides for a while, although it looks like they're, they're still working on it. So we'll see what, what happens. And uh, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 12 this morning. I want to remind you again tonight, we're going to be, uh, we're working towards the end of our Generations series on Sunday nights. We meet over in the Family Life Center. And we, we, uh, Try to make it a, an experience that crosses generational bounds. And we've had a good, uh, a good representation. Would love to have a few more families with kids come and take part in that and, and allow the older folks and, and the parents' generations and beyond to share their faith and their experiences with some of the younger generation. It's been a good experience in that so far, and we would love to have you come tonight as we talk about uh, faith, and we're going to spend some time talking about Moses and the Israelites as they crossed the Red Sea. So come and join us in that story tonight, that great story of faith, and we'll uh, look forward to doing that 5 o'clock in, uh, in the Family Life Center tonight. Also, I want to just kind of start uh, letting you know about our next sermon series starting in September. We're going to be uh, looking at discipleship through the eyes of Mark, and we're going to be looking through the Gospel of Mark. And thinking in terms of what that, how that informs us in terms of how to make disciples. That's been a, a focus this year, a focus in our, in our mission statement and in our vision. And we want to look a, a, little, more into a, a little more deeply into what it takes, what, what is involved when it comes to making disciples. And so we're looking forward to that. Hope you all are too. We have some fun things planned for it. And uh, working on making that a, a great series, informative series, one that really continues to move us down the road when it comes to, to making our mission and vision a reality. For the summer, we've been studying the book of 1 Corinthians. And last week, we talked about the, well, chapters 8 through 10, really, where Paul's speaking with the Corinthians, talking to them about the problem of meat that's, being, that's been sacrificed to idols. Is that something that you can eat as a Christian, or is it something that you shouldn't eat as a Christian? And as we talked about it before, as Paul delves into that topic, he, he really makes it a focus more on selfishness, on, on using our freedom in Christ to, to indulge our, our desires and our wants. It's all about us. And Paul says it shouldn't be that way. In fact, chapter 10 and verse 24, we talked about that being a good memory verse and about, as he tells them they shouldn't seek their own good but the good of others. We talked about how our world would change if we could simply live that out. Now, Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 8 was dealing with a direct question that was given to him, uh, the question about meat being sacrificed to idols. Do we eat it or do we not? And, and how, do we, how do we handle that situation between those who feel differently about it? In chapter 12, it's a little different. He, we don't know if there was a question or if this was a complaint that had been brought to him, a, an issue that had been brought to him, but it's the issue of of spiritual gifts and how spiritual gifts work in the working of the church. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. So keep your uh, uh, finger there in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and uh, we'll, we'll be getting into that in just a second. Just want to refer to a, our trip to Mexico this, uh, this last week. Aris and Alan Todd and I went to Baja, Mexico, and I was reminded then of a of a controversy down there, uh, one that gets to be pretty difficult. Even the Americans kind of get drawn into it when they get down there. You see, there's a, a, uh, a soda that's sold down there that's an apple-flavored soda, and it's really good, and you kind of forget about it when you're up here. It's hard to find up here. You can get it in some grocery stores. You can go to Latin American grocery stores and find it pretty regularly, uh, but, there are, but it's pretty popular down there, and both Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola have, have gotten rights to make that, and they both make their version of it. One's called Manzana Lift, and the other one is called Manzanita Soul. And, uh, and, and the kids especially love it down there. They, they drink that stuff up. 
But as you might imagine, and as happens with a lot of colas and stuff like that, they get into discussions that turn into kind of brutal fights over which one of those is best. Now, I wish I could have brought them and had, you, had, you, had a couple of you taste them just to kind of lift me up on this one, but there's really not much difference. I mean, it, they're, they, they're both apple-flavored carbonated beverages, and there's really not a lot of difference. And yet it's interesting to hear these conversations among especially the young people about why theirs is the best, and they form kind of different parties, you know, and, and uh, you've got the Need a Lift party, and you've got the Soul Brothers, you know, and they're, they're, they kind of do battle, they're almost like gangs, uh, fighting over which one of these things tastes the best. It's kind of human nature, isn't it? How we tend to take those, these things that we have, and even though they may have subtle differences, we want to say which one's better. Hazel eyes or brown eyes? Hmm, boy, that's a, that's a big difference there. You know, I'm not sure. The one's, one's just a little lighter than the other. Which one is better? Uh, it, we, we have a tendency to get, to get caught up in that. Um, you know, the, the hair color and things along those lines. Which one is best? I'm really hoping gray wins out because that's the direction I'm going. <laughs> I'm heading that way. Gray or, or nothing. You know, either way. <laughs> I'm hoping one of those, one of those comes out as, as champion because that's what I'm looking forward to. As we, move, as we move into the study of Scripture, Paul's dealing with some of the same things. You see, the, all, these, all these spiritual gifts have been proliferated there among the church in, in Corinth. And as human nature would have it, they're starting to think that one spiritual gift has an edge over another. You're just a little cooler if you can do this. Just a little more spiritual if you have this spiritual gift. And Paul, again, is trying to rein them in. We don't know if it's a question again or, or a complaint, if they've asked about spiritual gifts and, and which one may be the more desirable one, or if he's just heard that, that this kind of controversy is going on and he feels like he needs to deal with it. But you can tell as he speaks of this in, in 1 Corinthians 12, that he's needing again to take them from a worldly view of the issue to a kingdom view of the issue. And Paul does that again and again and again in 1 Corinthians. Takes them from a worldly view, it's not about you, to a kingdom view, it's about how you help others. That's a discipleship view too. Again and again in this book. We're going to look at uh, several passages here in several parts of Romans Romans, I keep thinking Romans. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Romans 12 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, so I, I get confused. We're going to read verses 1 through 11 here real quick. Read it with me. In, uh, in your Bibles, I've got the, the New International Version. 1 Corinthians 12, starting with verse 1. Now, about, spirits, about the gifts of the Spirit. Brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus, be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> there are several, there are different gifts, spirits, there are different gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To the one who is given through the, Spirit, through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by the means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. All of these are at work in one and the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now, by the time Corinthians was, was written, spiritual gifts had been around, well, at least 20 years, maybe more. They'd been around for a while. And Paul, undoubtedly, in his visit to, to Corinth and then those who had visited after, we know that in, in Bible times particularly, it was through the laying on of hands, that they were able to, to pass along the gift of, of these different kinds of spiritual gifts. But the gifts were brought through the Holy Spirit. It wasn't 
the person laying his hands on them that was giving them the gift. It was this transfer of the Spirit. And those kinds of things took place regularly, we see, in the, in the first century particularly. And as Paul and his fellow ministers came through, and apostles, and, and uh, the teachers that came through, and they, they began to, to allow these gifts to pass from them to the brothers and sisters in Corinth, you see that kind of thing happening. I can only imagine from a pagan culture, even from a Jewish culture, but particularly from a pagan culture, how interesting it must have been to have seen these miraculous gifts of the Spirit, to have seen people be able to touch someone and have them be healed, or to see someone be able to speak in a, in a different language without ever having to go through the, the pain of studying it. Wouldn't that be cool? And I'm sure they saw it that way, and they saw that spiritual people were able to do those kinds of things. We get the sense in reading chapters 12 through 14 that there was a special emphasis in Corinth given to the gift of speaking in tongues. Again, we get the sense that the kind of speaking in tongues that he's referring to there is this ability to speak in a different language without having studied it. And in a multi-language community like they would have had and like was the Roman Empire, I mean, walk down the road a few miles and you get a, you get a different language. What an interesting gift that would have been especially when presenting the gospel was your goal and your aim to be able to walk from community to community to community and regardless of the language, be able to speak their language. And they obviously thought it was really, really cool. It was something that was a powerful gift, something that they, were, they thought was special. But they went beyond special. And they started, we get the sense that they started to, and, and again, we're not given the, the, the exact content of, of what they were saying about it, but we get the sense that, that they were elevating the gift of speaking in tongues above, above some of the other spiritual gifts. That somehow maybe you were more spiritual or more godly if you had the gift of speaking in tongues. And it could also be, and in some circles even, I've seen it in, in some, thing, some churches today, that, that they say that if you can't speak in tongues that you don't have the Holy Spirit. I could see that being a a premise here in Corinth as well. Or it may be some feeling like, if I can't speak in tongues, maybe, maybe I don't have the Holy Spirit. Maybe he doesn't live in there. If I, if I can't speak in tongues, I see these other people doing it. Maybe that's where it is. The way Paul addresses it, I think, would fit with all three of those. Because he talks about the fact that it's one spirit, but a whole bunch of different gifts. A whole bunch of different things that he allows and enables people to do through his power that's working within them. But it's not for them. It's for the church. The gifts that he gives them, that he enables them to do as he works powerfully through them, he gives them specifically to help the church, to enable the church to grow, and to enable them to pass along the message of Jesus Christ. And that's, that's the important message that we, that we get here, the important message of this gift is not for you, it's for the church. It's to build them up. He says if you desire any of these gifts, and we'll look at this in a minute, if you desire any gift, if there's any gift that you would want more than any of the others, I would think it would be the ones that lift other people up. I would think it would be the ones that would inspire other people in their, in their walk with Christ. I would think it would be the ones that would lift, that would encourage others in their faith, not the ones that cause people to look at you and say, wow, what a spiritual guy or girl he, he must be. Again, that's that worldly view versus kingdom view. The worldly view says, look at me, look at how cool I am, look at the things I have. They're better because, well, I have them. The kingdom view says, what can I do to build others up? How can what God has given me be for his glory by lifting others and encouraging them in their walk with Jesus? In verses 12 through 26 of chapter 12, he goes into this analogy of, of the church and how it works like a human body. And I'll let you read that. I won't take the time to read that this morning. But he compares the two and he talks about how different parts of the body are made to work differently. They each have a function, but they're made to work together into one. Some of you have been in the medical fields or biology or things along those lines, and you know better than any of us how incredible it is 
that this, these different parts with different functions, some made of different kinds of material, different life types of forces, come together and make this body that works, well, pretty amazingly. I mean, we have little things that, that go wrong that, that, that we have to have take medicine for or have fixed once in a while or, or sometimes we have to live with, but most of the time things work pretty well. And they work pretty well even later into life. They allow us to interact. They allow us to do our work. They allow us to get along. Our bodies are amazing. But there are a bunch of different parts that work together. Paul says, you can't say to one body part, I don't need you. Or one body part can't say, well, I, I want to be this body. I want to be another body part, one that's better, one that's cooler, one that has more responsibility. He says we need all of them to make it work. Even the ones, and he indicates some of the body parts that are less significant. I've never had to live without a, a digit or an appendage, but I know people who, who have. Just even something as seemingly small and insignificant as a little toe. I know a guy that, that got his, slipped and his foot went under a mower. Yeah, that's not a good, that's not good. But he lost, his, he lost his little toe. We're laughing at that. That's not right. He lost his little toe in this, in this process. Dave, I'm sorry. But and he said, he said you, wouldn't, you can't imagine how different it is to, to walk without a little toe, that there's a lot of balance that that thing provides. You, again, it seems seemingly insignificant and yet very significant. Even things like that typically get taken out, like tonsils and adenoids and appendix, and, and appendix as appendices. I don't know how that goes. The, uh, but what, I, what I'm hearing is, is that even those, when they're functioning properly, and those get taken out often because they don't function properly, but when they're functioning properly, even those have a function, and they're important. What's the point he's making here? There are a lot of spiritual gifts. A lot of us are made up of different things with different backgrounds, with different gifting from God and from the Holy Spirit. All of them are important. They all make a difference. Someone says, well, I, I, can't, I can't teach a class. All right, all right. Can you watch some kids on the playground? Well, yeah, I can watch some kids on the playground. Awesome. I can't, I can't. Lead singing. I'm not much of a singer. Well, how are you at how are you at finances and accounting? Can you do something like that? Everything is important. Everything is necessary. We have things even in our world where we kind of order these things. Where human nature is, we tend to to, to establish a, a pecking order of sorts. And we think of one thing that's more important than the other. There, there are several, in fact, there are several things that go on every week and especially every Sunday at this church that are at their best when you don't know they're there. Think about that. They're at their best when you don't know they're there. Think about the people that clean the building. Usually when they're thought of, it's because something's what? Something's wrong. Something's broke. Something's dirty. Something ain't working right. That's when the cleaning people get, get, get noticed. When, everything, when they do their job perfectly, everybody just thinks it's as it should be. Am I right about that, Charlie? Isn't that, isn't that the way that works? I, I, I tell you, it was interesting at Northeast where I went to church before. They, uh, they decided they, wanted, they had a cleaning service that was coming and doing the cleaning in the building. And they decided they were going to save some money, try to, try to do without the cleaning service for a while. And they said, we'll just have families sign up to clean the building. I lasted about three weeks. Yeah, because the families that were coming were some of the same. It probably lasted three months, actually. But the same families were coming because, frankly, nobody else wanted to do that. And they, they thought, man, that's a lot of sweeping and a lot of cleaning and a lot of toilets to scrub and thing, things along those lines. And I don't know if I, I don't think I want to do that. That's not my gift, right? <laughs> And so it, it, was, it was interesting to watch, you know, it was predictable, but it was interesting to watch as we kind of, we'd get through to a Sunday morning and, you know, things hadn't been straightened up, they hadn't been cleaned up, well, who was supposed to do that? And they'd call them, ah, oh, things got, you know, and, 
And, and it was interesting because those three months, things were far worse than they had been when we had the, when we had the cleaning service that promptly got rehired because that's a difficult job. Think about the guys that, that run the, uh, the sound booth and uh, do the audio visual. Again, you don't know them unless something goes wrong. Their, their best day on the job is when everything works flawlessly because nobody notices. It just goes like normal. Maybe your job's like that, where, where you work, uh, whether it be fire control or, or things along those lines. Again, people don't know you're there unless something goes wrong, unless there's an emergency. And those things tend to get less appreciated, tend to feel like it's less important. But this passage, and I love this passage, because it reminds us that that's just not true. That there's no unimportant gift that God gives us. There's no unimportant job when it comes to moving the kingdom forward. And if we're doing our job with that kingdom view, whatever it is, whether it's teaching hundreds or thousands or watching one child while a mom and dad go in for counseling, whatever it is, the biggest jobs, the smallest jobs, it's important for moving the kingdom forward. As we're lifting others up, as we're praising God, it's important for us to remember that. Because we tend to do it too. We tend to place value judgments on things that people do here at church. We tend to give more meaning and more importance and more value to one thing than we do to others. This passage reminds us, and I love it, that everyone's important. That in God's kingdom, everyone matters. And he says, as he talks about the, the analogy of the body, there are some things that we think of as, as insignificant, but God has given them great importance. Parts that we, we think of as being secretive or things that we need to hide, God has given special significance. And it's important that we remember, each of us, that we have a job to do. That there is something we can do, some gift that God has given us, by which we can participate in what's going on in the kingdom. And I, I'll say this. If the extent of, of your involvement in church is coming on Sunday mornings or coming on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, and Wednesday nights, we're thankful for that. Love having you here. Love getting to know you. Love meeting your, your family, your kids, whoever else you can bring. But I want to tell you also that you may be missing out on a major blessing in your life. You may be missing out on the opportunity to use the gifts that the Bible here tells us God gave you. And he gave you not for your purposes necessarily as much as he gave you for kingdom purposes. You're missing the opportunity to use those gifts to advance that kingdom. You want to talk about being involved in something that's bigger than yourself? You hear a lot of folks talking about that these days. New surge in, in serving people and lifting others up and helping those who are downtrodden. And, and those are all great things. I'm glad our world is, is looking at, at lifting up people along those lines, maybe more than they have for a very long time. But the church is a place where if we're doing it right, if we're doing it the way God wants us to do it, we've, we should have been thinking about those things all along. That's our job. That's the ministry he gives us into the world to be Jesus' hands and feet as we move through this world. How can you be involved in that? How can you be involved in joining with the, those of us who, who continue to try to use our gifts on a regular basis to do the things that God has called us to do? And in doing so, in working together as a family of God, we catch that little glimpse of heaven each time we do that. As we work together to, to help a small church in Mexico, as we feed the, the homeless in, in our area, as we share the gospel with a neighbor or a friend, we take that time in working together to be the people that God has called us to be, and we move that kingdom closer to the ends that God has given us. You know, sometimes it's easy for us to think, well, I, I'm not really very talented. There's really not much I can do. I can't sing, I can't lead, I can't teach, I can't preach, I can't do the, you know, the important things, which we've just spoken about. Because God's saying, God's saying there is no unimportant thing. 
And there are a whole bunch of stories in Scripture that remind us of that. One that I thought of immediately is I'm, as I, I, I thought of one when I wrote the bulletin article, which is a similar thing if you hadn't had a chance to read that. But another one is when Jesus encounters the woman at the well. Remember, she was, not a, she was a Samaritan woman. Uh, Jews typically didn't talk to Samaritans, let alone Samaritan women. And Jesus had this whole running conversation with her. Starting at the, at the beginning where they're talking about water and Jesus talking about living water. And she says, give me some of this. And he goes, I will if you'll go back and get your husband. She says, well, I don't have a husband. And he says, you're right, you don't. In fact, you've had five and the guy you're with now isn't your husband. And she abruptly changes the topic. Ah, you're a prophet. Answer, this, answer the big question, the, the one that's between our, your people and my people. Where do we worship God? And Jesus talks about worshiping him in spirit and in truth, that real worshipers, genuine worshipers, will worship him in spirit and truth in the time that's coming. And she says, I've heard that there's a Messiah, a Christ that's coming. And Jesus says, yeah, that's me. I'm the one. This woman who was... I, I can only guess in Samaritan circles that those days it would have been similar to Jewish circles. And given her background that Jesus gives us a little insight on, she probably was somewhat of an outcast. She may have been one of a, of a bunch of women that a particular man was married to or that he had living with him. And she was the one that was sent to get water. You think that's the high man on the totem pole in the family? Probably not. And so she's going to get water, feeling pretty lowly, going during a hot time of the day, maybe to avoid crowds. I don't, I don't know. You guess. And this Jewish man is sitting there, and he talks to her. And he says, I'm the Messiah. She's excited. She runs back to town. God, you never guess what happened to me. I just met a guy that told me everything I've ever done. He says he's the Messiah people in town say tell us more she says I'll do more than that I'll take you to him and she did that this low man on the totem pole this sinner in the eyes of some this person who was very low status very unimportant probably just before that time would have said I can't do anything for God look at my past look at how I'm looked at in society look at what I can't do and God says yes but look at what you can do and because of her, that entire town, and who knows how many more, came to know Jesus. If she can do it, we can do it. If God gave her that power, he gave you and me that power. To have Jesus work through us, to have his spirit work through us, to use our giftedness to tell others about this incredible Savior. I don't know where you are now in terms of your activities, your being active in, in God's kingdom. If you're here this morning, and again, the extent of your service is to come to church, and, and that's what you can do, I, I, we're glad to have you. We really are. But I want to encourage you this morning to think about what does it look like to take that next step. If you're involved in a number of things here at church, again, I want you to think about what, what's that next step look like? That next step to continuing to use the giftedness that God's given you to his honor and to his glory. What does that look like? What can you do? Not what, can, what you can't do. What can you do for the kingdom of God? Maybe this morning you're here and this is kind of your first step. You've not been a Jesus follower in the past and you're wanting to think about that. But we'd love to talk with you about it. We'd love to tell you the reason why we are and why that's been so fantastic, so life-changing for us. It's helped us to get involved in this kingdom that's bigger than us, that traverses all time and into eternity. And we'd love to show you how you can meet, like the Samaritan woman did, show you how you can meet this Savior. It all starts with a step. During this song that Zach's going to lead us, you can... There'll be a number of people around the auditorium, some of us up front. You can choose one and go and talk to him. There'll be uh, folks out in the foyer, if you'd rather go out that way, that you can talk to. They'll pray with you. If you have a concern about your life and your walk or somebody in your life or somebody that you're wanting to pray about, those prayers will be kept confidential unless you ask them to share it to the whole congregation. Or if you want to come forward and take Jesus as your Lord today, to be baptized 
into his name, having your sins washed away and walking in that new life with that new view, that kingdom view, we invite you to come. Whatever your needs are, however, whatever you need to do to take that step closer to Jesus, we ask you to do that this morning. And we're going to stand and sing this song to encourage you.